Good morning, Tulsa Bible Church. My name is Maddie Boltinghouse, and I'm the Children's Director here at TBC. If you're new here, fill out a visitor card and drop it in our offering box. Youth, the weekend event will be on February 26th and 27th. Uh, Tulsa Surrounding Churches and us are hosting this event for the youth, and if you'd like to sign up, head to our events page on the website. You won't want to miss it. Our annual meeting will be January 31st at 6 p.m. At this meeting, we will be voting on new elders and deacons, but if you want to get to know them a little bit be beforehand, head to the welcome desk in the lobby, pick up a packet of their testimonies, and read through those before. We'll also at this meeting have an option to vote by proxy forms. We'll have more information on that um, at a later date, or you can call the church office if you have any questions. And last, head to our YouTube channel after the service today and check us out. We have a lot of good content for you on that. All right, that's all I have for us. Thank you so much for joining us today and have a wonderful service. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Um, we're really excited about this service today. If you would, let's all stand and sing.
to you alone belongs the highest praise.
seated and children you are dismissed now to children's church thanks daniel if you guys have your bibles i hope you do we're going to be in ecclesiastes 11 a passage that daniel read for us um 11 7 i'm actually going to stop at 12 7 we're going to uh, verse longer than that and if you're following along with us in our prayer calendars, I just want to remind you that, uh, that today is the day we're praying for our annual meeting that's coming up. Next Sunday evening at 6 p.m. we'll be in this room right here uh, for elders and deacons, new church officers. We'll get a report from Tom, our treasurer on our finance stuff, and just some updates on what's going on at TBC. So I want to welcome you to, to participate in that and join us, even if you're not a member. Uh, we'd love to have you for that meeting. Just you can't, will not be able to vote for it. And then I'll be giving a few directions on our, um, our proxy votes at the end of the service. So you guys just hang on for that as we begin. Our verse for today is Acts 1.8. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you will be my witnesses. Starting in Jer- Jerusalem to Judea and Samaria to the uttermost parts of the world. And so please join us as we pray as a church in unity for reaching Tulsa, our Jerusalem right here, and also the uttermost parts of the world through our missionary efforts, through everything that's happening where the gospel is is going about through the efforts here at Tulsa Bible Church. And and please grab one of those prayer calendars as you go. They're at the welcome desk. If you need some extra copies, just let us know. In 2003, Pixar released an Academy Award-winning animated film I'm a little bit dated here, but it's a, a movie that you guys all know and have probably cherished as one of Pixar's, one of the very first of the great Pixar movies. And it was called Finding Nemo. 
Finding Nemo was a, a story about a clownfish, Marlin, who lost his son on the Great Barrier Reef. And the whole plot is designed to show the love of a father in seeking out his son, doing whatever it takes, going to whatever measure to find and to bring back his lost son. And early on in the movie, it's funny, Marlin meets another fish by the name of Dory. And Dory's played by Ellen DeGeneres. It's just a, she's a great character in the movie. And she's known for having this acute short-term memory loss. And it's, it's just so funny because she's always forgetting conversations, facts, and details that she should know to help Marlon find his son Nemo. And one of the crucial junctures in the movie, she gets a, a message from a school of moonfish. And it goes something like this. As they're searching for Nemo and as they're going in the right direction, when you see the trench, don't forget. Swim through it, not over it. Swim through it, not over it. And as they swim away, again, this school of moonfish tell her and tell Marlin, listen, don't forget, don't forget. Swim through the trench, not over it. Well, of course, Dory forgets this message, for, fails to give it to Marlin in time. She remembers a little bit too late, and so he does what he normally does, which is he's going to do it just his own way. And he decides to go over the trench instead of through it. They meet this school of jellyfish. He just barely survives because of his friends, the sea turtles, right? You guys know the story really well. But the message from this scene and the message from, from Finding Nemo that really brings us to the text in Ecclesiastes is this. Don't forget. Don't forget. As parents, I think all of us have these constant admonitions to our children. Don't forget. Don't forget to brush your teeth at night. If you're Kennedy, don't forget to make your bed and to clean your room, right? Don't forget your lunchbox. Don't forget to clean up your room. Don't forget your jacket. Don't forget to hang up your clothes when you come home and, and put them away in your closet. We are constantly giving our kids this, this command, don't forget. And it's one of my favorite phrases to remind us of this lesson right here in Ecclesiastes. Now, we are in the last major section of the book of Ecclesiastes. And going from chapter 6, verse 9, all the way until where we're going to end today, this is just Solomon giving life lesson after life lesson after life lesson. This is the last one we're going to cover before we close the book of Ecclesiastes. That'll be in the month of February this year. We saw five life lessons so far. Today is the sixth. Uh, Solomon, the preacher, he tells us that the first life lesson is, is simple. It's life's not fair. Life's not fair. And remember, as believers, we don't want fair. Right, Gary? When we talk to God and when we seek God's face, we want grace. We want mercy. If we plead for fairness and for justice, I'm afraid that is something that we cannot handle apart from Christ and apart from divine grace. The second life lesson was, hey, let's develop some self-awareness. Let's know ourselves a little bit. Let's look into our own hearts before we look into everybody else's heart and their actions. Let's take the, the log out of our own eye before we look at the splinter that is in our, our brother's eye, right? And so develop some self-awareness. Thirdly, life lesson was respecting authority. The fourth life, life lesson that Kohelet gave us was very simple. Actions have consequences. We talked about why do we need to give this life lesson in today's world in Ecclesiastes? Well, we do. Actions have consequences, and guess what? You're responsible for your actions. Fifth, we talked about how God was in control last week. It developed a little bit of a theology of providence. This week, what we want to talk about, life lesson number six, is very simple. It's don't forget. And none of us know how long we have left to live. The passage that Daniel read for us this morning talked about the reality of death that was coming upon all of us. One thing we do know, however, is that it's never too soon to live for Jesus. And one of the things that Ecclesiastes chapter 11 verse 7 through chapter 12 verse 7 is going to tell us is that it's never too soon to start living for Jesus. It's going to address the young man in this audience. It is going to address the old man. In Ecclesiastes 11 through 12 here, there are three things 
not to forget. Don't forget that joy is a command. Chapter 11, verse 7 through 10. Don't forget that God is the creator. And don't forget that life is a gift. Joy is a command. God is the creator. And life is a gift. And again, this, this passage has a strong admonition to the young, but it also has an admonition to the old. And I love how Terry Pratchett uh, summarizes some of the sentiment that we're going to find in Ecclesiastes. He says, inside every old person is a young person wondering what happened. <laughs> Ecclesiastes is going to address the young person inside all of us. It's going to address the person who's the most seasoned in life with wisdom. It is going to address the most young person seeking for wisdom, learning and growing in humility. The first thing I want to talk about, the first thing in your outline this morning, joy is a command. Joy is a command. Now, before we look at some details, I want you to notice how Solomon and the preacher here emphasizes joy and pleasure Verse 7 through 10 contain two specific uses of the verb as a command to rejoice. One time in verse 8, rejoice. One time in verse 9, to rejoice. In verse 8, it's the older person who is commanded to rejoice. So if a person lives many years, let him rejoice in them all. In verse 9, it's the younger person. Rejoice, O young man, in your youth. Apparently, rejoice and and having joy and seeking joy is a command that covers all stages of life, irrespective of your age. Moreover, there are several other words that add to the theme of joy in this first group of verses in chapter 11. Life is described in verse 7 as being sweet. Seeing the sun is something that that Kohelet describes as good, and verse 9 adds the word cheer to an already uh, filled section with joy and pleasure. All the references to rejoicing and these words that reflect happiness and pleasure led one commentator to say that this section is the most optimistic section in the entire book of Ecclesiastes. In verse 9, your, your heart and your eyes are known as organs of desire, the organs of pleasure. Derek Kidner's commentary He labels this section as the bliss of being alive, of simply having life on this earth that is given to you from God. And I love how David Gibson puts this in his book on Ecclesiastes. He says, pleasure is a divine decree that we ignore at our own peril. We ignore at our own peril. It's almost as if our always gloomy, nihilist philosopher, Kohelet the preacher, started listening to a regular dose of Joel Olstein this morning. Maybe Joyce Meyer kind of crept into the the listening stages of his life here. Ecclesiastes seems to have made a very quick shift from gloom and peril and questioning of God to one now that is is pleasure, joy, and happiness. Look back at verse 7, how this starts. Light is sweet. And it is pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. Light and darkness are often used metaphorically in the Old Testament and the New Testament to describe life. Job 33 verse 30 talks about the light of life when Jesus comes on the scene. In John 8 and John 12, he talks about that he is the light of the world. And anybody who believes in him is called out of the darkness of the world and the darkness of sin. The Hebrew word for sweet in verse 7 is a word that often is used to describe honey. The point seems to be that that life is sweet, and we should savor it as such and enjoy its pleasures. The only statements that temper the mood of joy and pleasure in this entire section is about a twofold here. There's a reminder in verse 8 that the days of darkness will be many. You also have an understatement in verse 10 that our youth is fleeting and temporary. It reminds me of the the famous song lyrics. How do I know my youth is all spent? It's when my get up and go has gone up and went. Just like Disneyland, the happiest place on earth, has really long lines. 
Honeymoons and vacations are always way too short, just like recess has to end, and we're going to come back into class and study until the end of the day. Solomon reminds us not to give ourselves blindly to our desires, but to keep our pleasures in check, because God will judge all of our actions, and our actions do have consequences. The warning comes at the end of verse 9. God will bring you, all of his readers, all of us, into judgment. And I think this is a principle in Ecclesiastes 11. Happiness without holiness will always lead to regret in the sight of God. Happiness without holiness will always lead to regret in the sight of God. So we must resist one of the strongest idolatries that we have in this world, and that is the cult of the young. And this idol will eat you alive. Worshiping the, this god or goddess demands tireless efforts to always keep up with what is new, the tyranny of the new, to remain young, which is almost always directed to image. In the things we do, how we are portrayed to other people on the outside. And as powerful and as important as the command is to rejoice, we must always remember that joy itself is not our ultimate goal. We are not commanded as Christians to pursue joy for the sake of joy. Joy is not an end. Joy is a, a byproduct of something that we gain, a benefit that we gain when we seek something entirely different. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit that comes for, from pursuing someone with a capital S, not something. And I love how, how my favorite theologian has put this. He says, the inherent dialectic of desire itself. A dialectic is, is kind of something that appears to, to have this conversation between two things that oppose one another. The inherent dialectic of desire itself had, in a way, already shown me this. For all the images and sensations, if idolatrously mistaken for joy itself, soon honestly confess themselves as inadequate. Do you understand that if you pursue things for joy more than you pursue Christ, those things will lead to an inadequacy and into a frustration. They will never satisfy you like you will have be, satisf be satisfied by pursuing Christ in a relationship with him. This theologian continues. He says, joy is a byproduct. Its very existence presupposes that you desire not it, but something other and something outer. And so at the outset, Ecclesiastes 11, as we're getting close to wrapping up this life lessons teaching from the preacher, here's the first thing we're going to say. Don't forget that joy is a command, but also don't forget that joy is found in a person. Not anything this world has to offer. It is other. It is outside of you, and it is found only in Christ. Number two, in your outline. Don't forget that God is creator. Look down at chapter 12, and I want to read verse 1 and 2 again. <clears throat> Ecclesiastes 12, 1 and 2. Remember also your creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near, which you will say, I have no pleasure in them. Before the sun and the light and the moon and, and the stars are darkened and the clouds return after the rain. Now, typically we think of, of the doctrine of creation. Remember God as your creator in the days of your, your youth. Typically we think of it in terms of uh, maybe an alternative to evolution when we think about how the world got here, what was God's purpose in creating the world. That is typically where we land when we think about the doctrine of creation. In the beginning, God spoke things into existence. And as miraculous as that is, Unfortunately, a lot of times that's where we stop with the doctrine of creation. Ecclesiastes, however, uses creation as the wellspring of a life well-lived. Creation is a, a doctrine that informs every step of our journey with God. It, it is something that sustains us as we walk in a way that pleases God. Remembering God as our creator remember, means that remembering God made a good world, not an evil one. We were the ones who messed it up. Sin was the thing that messed up God's good creation. 
Remembering God as creator means acknowledging our dependence on him, because after all, he is the creator, which means everybody else is created. We don't have life in and of ourselves. Our source for life and our our maintained, our reason for existence is through something outside of us. It is through God as creator. Remembering God as creator means directing our worship to him and to him alone. If he created us, we answer back to him. We submit to him in a loving obedience. It was the Irish rock star Bono from U2. He loved the book of Ecclesiastes. It was one of his favorite books in the entire Bible. And here's what he said about it. He says, Ecclesiastes is a book about a character who wants to find out why he's alive, why he was created. He tries knowledge. He tries wealth. He tries experience. This man in Ecclesiastes, Bono says, tries everything. You hurry to the end of the book, and it says this, remember your creator. And Bono says, in a way, it's kind of a letdown once we get to the end of Ecclesiastes. And then he says, yet it isn't. Read this in in David Gibson's book on Ecclesiastes, and I I think this is so important, for especially for the young people in this congregation. I'm going to read this kind of slow. He said, you may consider yourself autonomous, um, self-sustaining, self-reliant, You may consider yourself autonomous, but you are incapable of knowing what should be done. You are incapable of knowing what wisdom is inside of yourself. You are a creature. And then he says this, our problems don't stem from our failure to stay in our garden. All the evils, and I choose that my words very carefully, all the evils of the world stem from us taking ourselves to be the creator rather than understanding that we are created. God is God and we are not. This is not just a a theology of creation and a doctrine of how things came to be. This is a theology of life and how we live on a daily basis to please the one that brought our lives into existence. Then we come to verse three through five. And what is this section doing in the book of Ecclesiastes? You guys catch this? It seemed like Kohelet's kind of crazy. Like, what happened to the doctrine of creation here? All of a sudden, we've got all these images, we've got all these metaphors, and I want to try to explain this uh, carefully the best way that I can. When we come to verses 3 through 5, you find it as one major allegory. I think the preacher is, is describing life. He's describing aging as an old house. As we get old, We suffer through the consequences of life and through decay, wearing out, things become ruined. As it is with our old houses, so it is with our old bodies. And so he gives all of these metaphors, and I think they're they're metaphors of the the physical body. All right, if you look down at verse 3, in the day when the keepers of the house tremble. Now, if I ask Henry what the keepers of the house are, he's going to do, he's going to flex. It's going to be like, this is the keepers of the house. My arms, it's my strength. I think, I think that's what Solomon is, is metaphorically describing. The keepers of the house are, are our arms. Then it talks about the, the strong men are bent. These strong men are our legs. The grinders cease. Uh, Daniel, what was your translation that you were reading this morning? Was that NIV? CSB. CSB went in a, a much different route. It talked about women in the context there of the grinders. I don't, I don't think that's in the Hebrew. Uh, the grinders might just be a metaphor for the teeth. When you get old, your grinders become few. They, they will fall out. Okay, so talk to Joe Shoup and make sure that you have healthy gums and healthy teeth, all right, or get them replaced or something. The windows are dimmed is the next phrase. It's, it's our eyes, Our eyes are the doorways through which we see life and and we perceive the things that are in front of us. And and everybody over the age of 70 in this room is saying, yep, I know exactly what you're talking about as I age and I get older. Um, They talked about the the doors are shut in verse 4, speaking of the ears. 
and rising at the sound of a bird. Do any of you guys have trouble sleeping at night, the older that you get? The smallest noises? Sometimes your, your hearing is going, and so those small noises don't really bother you because you can't hear them, right? But, but other times, we struggle to sleep at night. When we get a little bit older, we, we don't need as much sleep, perhaps. We're rising at the sound of, a, sound of a bird because we can't sleep. The daughters of song are low. ESV will say in verse 4, perhaps a reference to our vocal cords there. Afraid of what is high. Do you, as you get older, do you have a fear of falling? A fear of heights is a little bit different. I used to be able to ride roller coasters like the best of them. Here I am about to be 40. I will not go on a roller coaster again. I just, I can't do it. It just does something to my body and I do not like it. Um, anyway, a fear of falling as you get older. All of that is described right there in Ecclesiastes. And then he gives you two images. One is of an almond tree in, in blossom. And you guys know when an almond tree blossoms, it produces a very white flower. It is bright. You see them in the springtime. It's a metaphor of, of growing gray as you get older. The gray hairs become more numerous. The other colors start to kind of fade away a little bit. You get an image of a grasshopper, not usually when you think about a grasshopper, man, those things are jumping like crazy. This grasshopper is just dragging along. And if you see a grasshopper just dragging along or a cricket or something, man, that thing is about, is about expired. He's, he's soon and quick at death. And so Solomon puts this metaphor of an old house in the same context as remembering God as creator. So as we age, we remember the God who created us and gave us strength. We remember the creator God who gives us salvation. We remember especially that the one who made us is the same one who redeems us. We bring to light the great passages about Christ as our creator and the, person of the second person of the Trinity in Colossians 1, 16. For by him all things were created, including you and me. In heaven and on earth, both visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and all things were created for him and for his glory. I've heard it said that getting old is the hardest thing that will ever happen to you in life, and so that's why God saved it for last. John Newton, the famous slave trader who came to faith in Christ, uh, penned the, uh, the amazing hymn, Amazing Grace. At the end of his life, he's known for saying, although my memory is fading, I remember two things very, very clearly, that I am a great sinner and Christ is a great Savior. I love that. So Solomon is, is giving us some life lessons. He's, he's telling us some things not to forget. The first thing he tells us is don't forget that joy is a command. And joy is found in a person, not a thing. The second thing he says, don't forget that God is the creator, especially in your youth and, and also for the elderly. God is your creator, he is your maker, he is your redeemer, and he will sustain you and give you strength through life. The third thing he says, don't forget that life is a gift. Life is a gift. Look down at verse 6. Before the silver cord is snapped, or the golden bowl is broken, or the pitcher is shattered at the fountain, or the wheel is broken at the cistern, and the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns who, to God who gave it. Now, it's hard to identify a one-to-one -one correlation for all these metaphors, golden bowls, silver cords. One of the uh, really strong interpretations for this verse is that Kohelet is giving us images in pairs. And so put the twos together. Golden bowl, silver cord, those two go together. Pitcher, wheel at the cistern, those two go together. If you combine them, golden bowl and a silver cord could be a metaphor for a lamp in the ancient Near East. A golden lamps were, uh, or a, a golden a bowl shape was filled with oil to give light, and then you would put a wick inside of that that bowl, light it, and it would give light to everything that is in the room. Perhaps 
Just like Zechariah chapter 4 mentions, this golden bowl here is a lamp. And the silver cord is the wick of the lamp that reflects light. And soon, that golden bowl, that wick goes out, and life is gone. It no longer brings light. Likewise, pitcher shattered, a water pitcher being shattered, and a wheel at the cistern. These are things that you would find at a well that give you life. You send the water uh, buckets into the well, you pour the water into the pitcher. And if that pulley system at the top of the well is not working, there is no way that you're going to go down and get the water from it. Some interpreters just take each image separately. Gold and silver are, are images used because of their high value. They are precious. Water pitchers and wells are, are necessary for sustaining life. This is what we need to exist. And so whatever the case may be, Solomon is, is making a strong case that life is precious. Life is a gift. It's a divine gift. And we should rejoice in it, and we should value life, not only our life, but the life of those who are around us, including the life of the unborn and the sanctity of life that we celebrate at this time of year, even for the unborn. God is the giver, and he is the sustainer of life. But life in this fallen world is not always what it was designed to be, what it was cracked up to be. A life in this world, because of sin, falls short far too often of what God originally intended. The reason we know this is because people suffer. The wicks go out way too early. The bowls are, are broken way too early in life. But the truth of the gospel, and, and this is where, where Solomon is just going to cause us to focus our attention outside of this earthly life. He continually draws us in to the fact of our death and asks us, is that it? Is this earthly life all that there really is? Or is there something beyond that, right? All of us need to consider if this world really is all that there is, why would we have any hope for anything? Why would you do anything that's significant whatsoever? There is no hope. 70, 80 years of life, you live, they come, they are gone, eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow you die. That is, that is one of the secular, godless perspectives that you will read even in the book of Ecclesiastes. Right? But if there's something beyond, if there's something more that this life is just leading up to, if Ecclesiastes 3 is true, that God has set eternity in the hearts of men, if it's true that there is a judgment day to come, as chapter 11 just told us about, if it's true that, that we are created for something more than just this world or more than just temporary, then we have to seek that, find it, and trust and live through it. God has given us, through the truth of the gospel, a way to escape the reality of our death. He has given us something beyond physical death into eternity. The truth of the gospel is that through Christ, even though we will die physically, we will live spiritually if we place our faith in Christ. Ecclesiastes is urging us to look beyond this world, to consider the significance of eternity and something beyond ourselves, something that gives us hope, something that transcends anything that this world has to offer. But while we have this life on the earth, it is a gift, and we should celebrate, and we should rejoice in the days of our youth. And we should know that they are a gift from God. As we close, I, I want to just um, bring two points of application. One to the young in the audience, and one to the old. All right? To everybody who is young here at TBC, for anybody who is listening even online, don't settle for the world when God is offering you a kingdom. Don't settle for a temporary, unsatisfying world when God is offering you an eternal, satisfying kingdom that is found only through Christ. There is no better time to start living for Jesus than right now. None of us know the day of our death. None of us can predict the things that were going to happen to us even before we get home after church today. And so we don't look for the things which are temporary. We look to the things which are eternal. We look to the things that are far beyond anything that this world has, has to offer with an eternal glory that cannot be compared to anything that is worldly. Ephesians reminds us 
The time to live as Gentiles, the way that we used to live apart from Christ, is over. It is sufficient to live the time that we have lived in sin apart from Christ. And so move on past those days and pursue a life that is gratifying <clears throat> and satisfying in Christ. We are to take off the old sinful ways and we are to put on newness that is found in Christ. And God created our desires as good. And those who are young in this room, we have a lot of desires. We have to pursue those desires how God created us to pursue them, not outside of his will pursuing what he designed for us to pursue. The Psalms has this great verse, to delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the satisfying, enjoying desires of our hearts. One of my favorite theologians put it this way, do not settle for mud slums when eternity is before you. Listen to this, it would seem that our Lord finds our desires not too strong, but actually too weak. C.S. Lewis says, we are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us. And like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in a slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea, he says, we are far too easily pleased. If that's not a statement that describes a postmodern and a modern mentality, I don't know what is. But you have to have the faith and the trust to realize that those things are mud pies. They are nothing compared to what we have for us in Christ and in his kingdom. And so we listen to the words of Jesus when he tells us to seek ye his kingdom first, and all those other things will be added to you. We have the mind of Christ that dwells on the things which are pure and excellent and lovely and of good repute. And we stay focused on those things as we walk through life. My admonition to the young, don't settle for the world when you are offered the kingdom of God. My admonition to the old is quite different. My admonition to the old, and I think where Solomon is driving to in these passages. I'm going give to you, give you a story as I explain this one. When I went off to Mississippi State, I was, a, I was a college golfer, and all I wanted to do was to date girls, to party, and to hit a golf ball as far as I could and as long as I could, as many times as I could. That was my, that was my life ambition. 18 years old, I went from Milwaukee, Wisconsin, down to Starkville, Mississippi. And if you would have told me the things that were going to happen to me, were actually going to happen to me at that time, I would have never, ever believed you. But here's what happened. Uh, a guy on my college dorm room floor started talking about a, a campus crusade Bible study that he was going to. I don't have time for any kind of Bible study. I didn't even know books of the Bible and what they were. So he invited me to go to this Campus Crusade Bible study. I didn't have any friends that I knew that went to school there. I just, okay, let's go. And I heard the message of the gospel there as a college student. I trusted Christ my freshman year, really close to the time when school was, was just starting. And through that Campus Crusade Bible study, I met a man by the name of Butch Simmons. And when I met him, again, I was 18, 19 years old, freshman in college, Butch was about 55 or 56. And there is no reason as a young guy going through college that I would spend intentional, regular, scheduled times for this man at the age of 55 to disciple a college student through five years at Mississippi State. He poured his life into mine, and it didn't really matter that he's, he was bald on the top and he was gray everywhere else. He was my best, he is my best friend. And he took the time to teach me the gospel, how to study scripture for myself, how to live a life that ultimately pleases God when my life was going in a completely different direction. So for all of you guys that are in this congregation, this is way too serious to look over too quickly, and this is way too important for you to bypass without thinking about it. 
You, more than any other person in this room, has the ability to take somebody younger alongside and to disciple them in the faith. You have an opportunity to be a Paul to a young Timothy or a Moses to a young Joshua. And there are people in this room who desperately want somebody who will give them truth to live their life by. I want you to turn to Titus chapter 2. And let's just look at a few verses. As ancient as this book is, and how otherwise timeless it might seem, there is so many great admonitions for the old in the church, and how they can function in the body of Christ with, with significance, identity, and really use your gifts to pour into people. In Titus 2, the model of ministry and the model of discipleship, discipleship is simply this. Older men disciple younger men. Older women disciple younger women. This is what you are called to do in the body of Christ. And I guarantee you there are so many people that are just longing for these types of relationships and who desperately want it. Titus 2 verse 1, as for you, young Timothy, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in the faith, in love, and in steadfastness. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanders or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good, and so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home, kind and submissive to their own husbands, that the word of God may not be reviled. Likewise, urge the younger men, and, and this is to the older men, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity. I don't, I don't know why Butch Simmons came into my life. It doesn't make sense. I didn't go to Mississippi State looking for that. But God brought me there for that very reason. And there are some young people in this congregation who are looking for that type of relationship. God is calling you to find these relationships. If TBC is going to be a discipling church, right? If we are going to be a church that is on a mission to know God and to make him known. Older men, older women, we desperately need your help to do this. How can I plug in? How can I use my gifts in the body of Christ at TBC? Find somebody younger and disciple them. Pour into them. Teach them how to live a life that is pleasing to God. How to study scripture. Teach them the truth of the gospel. Teach them that God is creator. He is sustainer. Take them through books of the Bible. Pray with them. That model of ministry and that discipleship will multiply and flourish if we will get a hold of it here. There are many of you in this room who are doing that. Continue. Continue doing that vital, vital ministry in the body of Christ. All right. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, um, all of us, every day of our life, we take one more step toward becoming older and one more foot in the grave, perhaps, is the image. Um, Father, my prayer for us is that as we get older, uh, we will be drawn closer and closer to you. My prayer is that TBC will be known and, and will flourish as a church that disciples, where the older teach the younger, where people seek out meaningful relationships that will absolutely change their life because of Scripture and because of the gospel. Lord, help these, help these relationships to come to fruition right here at TBC. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you bring people into our lives to do these things. We thank you for your truth. We pray that our lives will be by, guided by it every step of the way. We pray all these things to you, Father, through the Son and by the Spirit. For you three are the one true God, and there is no God besides you. Amen. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. Um, as you go today, you're going to see at the welcome desk, you've got testimonies. You've got a nominating report that's out there, a half sheet of paper. You're also going to find proxy ballots in a proxy form. 
If you know somebody who wants to vote at the annual meeting and they are a member at TBC, uh, take one of those proxy forms with you as well as a proxy ballot with you. You can bring that back at the annual meeting and somebody can place that vote for you, okay? Uh, if you have questions on how this is going to work, I want you to talk to Bill Riggs or Dave Sargent. Uh, any of your shepherding elders should be able to work this just with the restrictions of COVID. We want to make sure that uh, we make, make these opportunities available to you. And I'm sure you guys understand that. We want you to be a vital, vital part of this body. And every year at our annual meeting, this is a great part where we come together um, to think about future leaders, to elect these leaders, and what's going on in the body of Christ. So please be encouraged. Stop by the welcome desk if you need those things. Prayer calendar, welcome packet is also there. Have a great Sunday. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. We'll see you guys next time.